Um, as I said, it's been a while since I've been on a stage talking to anybody and Today I'm going to talk to you about Open Invention Network. You're sort of going to get double bubble in that I'm also very quickly at the end going to talk a bit about Open UK since I have an audience in the UK. Um, I'm Amanda Brock. I'm the CEO at Open UK, but I'm also a European representative at Open Invention Network. And the, the role I have with OIN, I've had since the beginning of 2013. So I've done this for quite a long time. My background is that I was a lawyer for 25 years and I worked in a variety of different sectors and different companies across tech. I worked in all sorts of different things from automotive to fashion to catering, largely doing IT and tech through that. But I've also worked across the tech sector in things like data centers, mobile network operators, and for an open source company, Canonical, which I'm going to talk about in a, a minute or two. Um, I guess that I got involved with OIN largely through Canonical and partly because my role in the legal space meant that I was doing a lot around licensing and a lot around patents and IP. And having joined Canonical, I was the I think it was employee 165. And if you don't know, Canonical is a bunch of guys out there with the Ubuntu, with the orange. Um, I was employee 165 and we had no legal team and I joined thinking that I knew all about open source because I could write a contract definition as to what open source was. And I then spent six months being overwhelmed by all the information that was coming my way. Uh, and it, it really was overwhelming. It was a lot to take on board. And I was learning about open source from uh, a group of people, I was gonna say a group of guys, it was mainly a group of guys who were developers who'd worked in the Debian project, got involved in Ubuntu and ended up being the early stage developers at Canonical. And it was a bit of a baptism of fire because they were very keen to tell me what I didn't know. And they would use, particularly in writing, A-N-A-L, but, I am not a lawyer, but you're wrong, Amanda. And they would explain to me in all sorts of different ways why I was wrong. And sometimes they were right, you know, given the Jews, they're a super smart group of people. And they, they really understood how things like licensing worked. And they understood it because it had evolved from the developer space through the history of free and open source software. And I'm sure many of you already know about licensing. But generally, when we think about open source licenses, what we're really talking about is copyright. And we're thinking about how copyright exists in our software and how we're going to share it with other people. And you probably all know that you can't use code that belongs to somebody else unless they give you a right to, to use or have a shot of it. And that's where your license comes from. So most of it is in copyright. But there's also this issue around patents. Now, I don't think anybody who's been in the tech space in the last decade or two can have avoided patents. And whether you love them, whether you hate them, whatever your personal views are, they exist and we have to deal with them. And they've proven to be quite a challenge at points for the open source communities. Um, I, this is a deck mostly that I've inherited from OIN. I used to have a deck many years ago that had a lot of protest pictures around software patents. And between us, I don't know if this has been recorded, if it goes online, it goes online, but between us, I don't think software should be patented. But that is very much my personal opinion. And it is a logical and rational opinion that I can justify. And it's about the nature of a patent. So when you have copyright, it gives you a protection from someone coming and taking your code and copying exactly what is there. When you have a patent, you have a very different beast and effectively what you're getting is a monopoly right. And you get a right to stop anybody else from taking the invention that you've created, something that's novel that you've uh, caused to happen, and you get a, a registered right to stop others from using it. And that right exists for a period of time which can be renewed and it tends to be very expensive to create. And the very fact that it's expensive to create makes it prohibitive for many people. Now, the reason I personally do not like patents in the software space is that patents were designed, even though they're a monopoly, to reward innovation. They were meant to encourage innovation and nothing to do with OIN, but my personal view is that they do the opposite in the technology space, particularly in software. 
And as we go through this talk, I'll, I'll explain a bit about why I think things have shifted and why the financial services sector is more and more engaged in open source and why this is all relevant to that sector. But what we see is um, an increased ability to patent. And you've had companies which have been building up these portfolios of patents, particularly in the US from the 60s and 70s onwards. And they have these huge armories. And those armories really played out in the Android patent litigation. And if you ever, you know, if you just Google Android patent litigation, you'll see a spider's web of different um, suits and counter suits with people fighting and spending tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars on patent litigation. And you'll probably have seen in the press that most of them settled. And I can tell you that the only people who won were the lawyers. And lawyers made an absolute fortune out of it. Now, if you, if you contextualize this, what you have is something designed to reward innovation which can be quite prohibitive of innovation and can preclude small entrants coming into the market by giving a protection for an idea. Now that all comes with the caveat that that's Amanda Brock's opinion, not OIN's. OIN is patent agnostic, but what it has done is create an extremely elegant solution to that patent problem. And the way the solution works is that anybody who wants to can go to the OIN website and sign up for free. You don't have to pass any qualification to sign up. There is no restriction on who can do it. Anybody can go along as an individual, as a company, as a project and sign up. And what you sign up to is something called a cross license that I'll, I'll go into a bit more in a moment. But that cross license in its most basic form says, I, Amanda Brock, offer everybody else here who signs up a license to use my patents in a specific sphere. And that specific sphere is with respect to open source software in exchange for you doing the same to me. Now it doesn't cover all open source software, it covers a Linux system definition. So to the extent that my patents relate to that Linux system definition, open source software, I'm gonna give you the right to use it and you'll do the same in return. So what we did at Canonical was we didn't just sign up to that, but we went a step further and we actually invested $5 million in OIN. Um, OIN has this very general enabling open source purpose and it enables open source through that cross licensing model and through that industry defensive patent organization. And it's the biggest defense, defensive IP or patent organization in history, not just in open source, but in anywhere ever. And what Canonical did, and around the same time TomTom Tom did it, was invest $5 million each joining this group. And six of these eight companies, IBM, Red Hat, Suze, it was Novell at the time, NEC, Sony, and Philips, each invested $20 million. And Google and Toyota have done the same since. And you can see the timings up here. And they did that not just because they're super generous companies, right? They have obligations to shareholders. Companies don't throw that kind of money away. They do it for a reason. And I would say that those companies had a huge amount of foresight and understanding of the role that open source was going to have over the next, at least last decade, but I would say many decades to come and saw this as a way of building an infrastructure with a bit of upfront investment from them that enabled everybody, as we've digitalized, to benefit from open source, but to do it in a way that's much more secure through the benefit of that elegant patent structuring, that defensive structuring. Um, I've explained this at a very high level. So OIN now has over 3,500 members. Sometimes when you see member, it gets a bit confusing. What this slide really means is licensees. So people who've gone along, ticked the box and signed up and committed to sharing their patents with everybody else in the group. Um, that means that there's over 3 million patents in that pool. Now, there isn't a list of what patents those are, but it works from the date that you sign up until the date you leave. So if you decided to sign up and then in six months time, you wanted to patent something that you thought was going to be part of that open source definition and you didn't want coverage, you could withdraw. But even if you withdrew, everybody in the group who had been there before that withdrawal date still got the benefit of the six months. So it's a very practical, very simplistic model. And I think its elegance is in the fact that it works so simply. Um, I'm going to ignore the patent portfolio and come back to that later. 
And then the Linux system definition is run by a chap called Rob Taylor, who's one of our board members at Open UK and is based here in the UK. And Rob runs that by getting suggestions from the members who you've seen listed up there, the funders, but also from anybody who has an OAN license. And those suggestions are pulled together and every year to 18 months, the Linux system definition, that list of a couple of thousand packages is updated. Um, if you look at the breakdown of the definition, you see that it evolves and it evolves over time and it evolves to really follow where open source is going and has gone. Uh, one of these slides uses the word slipstream and it is very much the case that it follows along the slipstream of development of the Linux Foundation and other community organizations. So all of these projects plus the, uh, the, the, the key foundations have software that is covered from this. And we saw things like Hyperledger, which will be on here somewhere, go in to the definition, but it took time. And it took time because the packages don't get added until they're stable. So everything about it is very structured and very practical. One of the concerns people sometimes have is that, oh, I sign up and you could add anything you like. But when you add that anything you like, it affects everybody in the pool. Now, the control sits with the founding members who funded it. You always have the right to walk away if you don't like what their decisions are. But that they have a technical group with representation from all of those companies, including Con Canonical and TomTom, Tom, as well as the eight um, key members. And they all have to live with the decisions they make. So the chances of a, some of those conservative multinationals making a decision that's really going to impact your patent pool are pretty slim. And what we've seen is a shift. And that shift in OIN represents to me a shift that I think anybody who's been around open source for a decade or more has also seen. Back in sort of 2008, 9, 10, when I joined Canonical, I spent my days, um, I was the point of escalation in all commercial agreements. So I dealt with all the negotiations across the business, across the, the desktop distribution, across enterprise, all the different spaces. And I spent my days talking to lawyers and talking to procurement people. And you can imagine it was pretty, um, I don't know what the best word to use for it is. I could say stressful. It wasn't so much that, it was tedious in a way. I was becoming a parrot. And I was becoming a parrot because I was repeating myself day in, day out, explaining to people why open source was the best way to do this and why it wasn't massively risky. Now, I'm sure those conversations still continue today, but they're different. And they're different for two reasons, in my opinion. One is that we have a different world and our world now centers around technology and software. Businesses have digitalized. If they hadn't digitalized before the pandemic, they've done it at a rate of knots. Um, I used to refer to reluctant technology companies, but I think they are all over the line now. And I think it's hard to say that any company is not a technology company. And to my mind, that's whether their product is created, distributed or consumed. Somewhere in that supply chain, it will be technology. Somewhere they need to use software and they need to have engineering support. And I think that shift has broadened out the base of who gets involved with OIN from where it started. When I was first involved, it was very much the open source companies, then it moved to the tech companies. And then as this slipstream has evolved and we've seen open source spread across different um, sectors, whether it's something like the mobile network operators who've adopted at scale or the automotive industry, you see a pattern that evolves where it goes into a sector, they become a user, they start to self-organize, they start to contribute back. And at that point, they deal with the governance effectively and efficiently. And that's when they join up to OIN at scale or something provokes it. The other thing that's happened, and I think it's really significant, is the shift that we've seen around um, repos and that has caused a massive shift in how software is procured. So if you look at something like GitHub or GitLab, where you have this dispersed uh, contribution, this dispersed um, code, what that's enabled is developers to bring software into organizations without going through that somewhat tedious procurement and legal process. 
And instead of it taking six or nine months of negotiation for someone like me, instantly you've got that software coming into your business and you've got it being taken and used. You can kick the tires, you can decide that it works or it doesn't work for you before you make that decision to have any financial investment at all. And what that means is that developers and engineers these days can avoid that whole procurement and legal engagement or approval process. Now, a well-run company is going to have an open source policy, whatever the company does, and it's going to have procedures. And to bring the code in, you should be following those. They may have you know, restrictions around certain kinds of licensing, that kind of thing. If it's something that you think your company needs and doesn't have, I would recommend Open Chain and taking a look at SPDX. There's a couple of standards there that are free to use and will give you some guidance on how to manage your supply chain and how to create policies and procedures. So what we've seen is a shift through digitalization at the same time as we've made software more accessible and more easy to use. And as that evolves, that housekeeping, that good governance falls into place. And to my mind, um, OIN and signing up to that defensive patent organization as part of the good governance that you ought to follow. And it's not only changing the way that we procure, it's changing the way we invent, and it's causing more and more collaboration. And I think that's something that we're really seeing through organizations like Finos in the financial services sector. So you're seeing organizations that would traditionally compete come together in a state of co-opetition. Um, I think my first really big understanding of that was back at Canonical, where I was one of the lawyers who did the work setting up OpenStack, which went on to be the Open Infra project. And as part of our deal signing up, we had to put a certain amount of legal time in. Nobody asked me before they committed us to it, but hey-ho. So I ended up working on that structuring. And in the day, at that stage, Canonical was taking on Red Hat, and I think we took over 70% of the cloud market almost overnight, yet we were sitting around tables, working together, collaborating. Arm and Intel were doing it, Dell and HP were doing it. And that sort of tech coopetition is something that follows also in the slipstream. And as you see sectors, whether they're business or whether they're public sector, engage more with technology, more with software, make that shift, make that move, what you see is the slipstream effect for organizations like OIN and governance around open source. And I've, there's a few slides here, I'm not gonna spend ages going through them, um, but they set out some of how that community is built. There's a whole raft of different um, samplings of members. Now, if you look at that, lawyers in those companies have been through this and signed both the agreement off and the structuring and what it, the impact that has on a company. So if you are interested in this and your own legal department are pushing back, I would be challenging why. Of course, pushback is healthy and of course you should be discussing it and able to talk them through it. OIN has a squad of us all around the world who can come in and help and support that discussion. But what we see increasingly is banking and financial services engagement. And some of that, as I've said, is this natural shift, this natural progression of open source into financial services. But some of it, is also to do with the state of the financial services market and your IP and your litigation. So there was a, a, a space and time, God, I can't remember time. The last couple of years makes time for me at least all a bit strange. I think it was about five years ago that Tencent signed up. Barclays signed up last year, partly in response to what was happening in patent litigation in financial services. And then in the last few weeks, Square, Stripe and others have signed up and there's been a, a relatively large amount of press around this. And some of this is down to PAEs, as they're now called. They used to be known as NPEs or colloquially as trolls. Um, I'm assuming most of you will know what a troll is, small hairy beast that lives under a bridge. And some of them also own patents. And the reason they are called trolls is obviously they troll. But NPE, non-practicing entity, or PAA, patent assertion entity, because what they do is assert patents. They don't run a business. So they go around and they buy up patents and then they use them to threaten people. And that's another reason that I personally don't like patents, is the ability to do this. Um, and what happens there is that you start with uh, an initial assertion. You may well end up with some litigation. Many of you will have seen what happened to GNOME 
and that a uh, Rothschild, a, a, a PAE or an MPE who didn't quite understand what they were taking on, asserted against the GNOME Foundation, one of the open source foundations. And GNOME has a history of being brave when it comes to litigation. They did the same over a trademark a few years ago and they went out to their community and they asked for help. And that involved a massive fundraising exercise. I'm terrible with numbers and I can't remember what they raised. It involved a law firm giving them pro bono legal advice and it involved OIN supporting them in the background. And that kind of support, that hand-holding, that making sure that you follow the steps that will make a litigation as painless for you as possible is the kind of thing that OIN can offer. Um, it also, do you remember I said that I wouldn't mention the patent portfolio? I can flick back, but I don't think you need me to. There is a patent portfolio that's held by OIN. Now, I think when you explain OIN to people, it can often just confuse them, but I'm gonna to talk to you about it in this context because it's about litigation. So there is this discrete patent portfolio that OIN has invested over $100 million in buying over the last decade. And it's patents that are not specific to open source. You also might remember I said there are people who've been building these armories of patents since the 60s. And it's sort of playing them at their own game by creating for the open source community a treasure chest of patents. And those patents are freely licensed to everybody who signs up to OIN. They can't be transferred without being encumbered. And what that means is if they're transferred out, you're right if you're an OIN licensee, is something that the new owner buys. So they have to live with it, it's encumbered with it. And that pool is there to defend against litigation. It will never be asserted, it will never be used in a challenging way, it will only be used in a defensive way. And when you have a patent litigation, one of the first steps is to counter sue. And it's a standard behavior. Gnome did it, and Gnome did it to say that your patents aren't valid. And that's one of these lists of the OIN-led actions that they can help on. Another is that they could potentially transfer one of those patents in their treasure chest or their war chest to you. But there's a raft of different responses. If you are ever on the receiving end of one of these uh, threats, do not do anything about it without speaking to somebody that really understands what they're talking about. There are things like confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements that you will see get handed over in a very blasé fashion as if it's not really part of the litigation. And there are clauses generally in those that can stuff you for the rest of your litigation. So just don't move, don't do anything without speaking to somebody that really knows what they're doing there. If you look at this slide, What's interesting is, unlike the other sectors, the financial service sector last year saw an increase of 111% in patent litigation, and it's mostly around open source. So I won't go into too much detail, but a specific group are targeting open source and patent litigation and financial services. And these um, PAEs tend to, attack in a couple of ways that are consistent. One is that they'll go after whoever they think has got deep pockets and the financial services sector. Whether you think after 2008, you're all still struggling and your bonuses are rubbish, blah, blah, blah. You still look like you've got money. You are big established institutions or fintechs that are getting massive valuations. So you become a target through that. The second thing that we've seen a pattern of for many, many years, is that the PEEs tend to attack the periphery. So if you look back at the Google litigation, the Android litigation, they didn't go after Google for a long time. They go after everybody in that supply chain, everybody who's an end user, and they try and pick those out because they're going after the weaker participants in the herd. And if they're able to pick them out, they can build a case that makes it very compelling when they go after the main target. So it is really important to have that base understanding. Um, there's a whole two slides of lists of litigation in the financial services space. Now, I obviously don't have time, um, nor am I probably the right person to go through all the detail, but what I can do if anybody wants to know more about this is I can get someone at OIN to speak to lawyers or anybody in your organisation who needs the information. Um, and you see that six of the most recent financial services suits were against 10 most widely used open source packages. 
This list is something that you would use internally to help get OIN into your organisation. It's the things that you need to know when you're explaining it to business colleagues and in particular lawyers who would have to make the decision for you. If you think you get a, a decision about OIN without actually speaking to anybody in your legal team, something is going to go wrong before you sign it or you're doing something you shouldn't. Your legal team must and should be engaged and be comfortable with what you're doing. So that's as much as I want to say to you about OIN. I'm happy to, to sort of do a general discussion. I can do it now or I can just keep going till I finish. It's quite strange having real people. Normally I talk to a cat. Um, he's a very knowledgeable cat. He's probably one of the most knowledgeable cats in open source, although he's only coming up for two. But I basically got him right before lockdown and made him sit and listen to me. And I've spent the whole 18 months looking at a screen where most of the, I don't know about you guys, but most of the time when I'm presenting, I can't see anybody. It's so novel to see people. Um, and to, I mean, you actually look like you might be listening to me. I can't fully tell with the masks, but it's just not been like that for so long. Uh, I'm sort of waiting to be knocked over by the cat or have my screen, which I don't have here, disturbed. So the other hat that I wear, as I mentioned in the beginning, is Open UK. And I can see a couple of Open UK people in the room. They're everywhere at this conference, which is so pleasing to me, I can't tell you. I, I joined Open UK at the end of 2019. And initially when I was asked to join, I wasn't particularly enthusiastic because I wasn't sure about something that was country specific for open source. Because what we we're all about is collaboration and being global and that diversity that that brings. And when I saw what was happening with Brexit and I saw what was happening in the European Commission where lots of really good open source stuff was being done, I wanted to get involved. And Open UK was a sort of, it was a brand, it was a website and not much else at that stage. And I, I took a bit of a personal risk on it. Um, unless I raised my salary, I wasn't gonna get paid. And we started with a mission that was UK leadership in open technology. And we specifically went to open technology. We moved away from open source software. I think we were the first organization to formally do that. Although many others cover hardware and data too. And we, we did that because in 2020, we didn't believe that you could look at software on a standalone basis. Um, we have shifted in July, and uh, it was a great delight to me that the board were able to approve this in one session. And we shifted away from that UK leadership to UK leadership and global collaboration in open technology. And it's a subtle difference that I think ethos wise really matters. And we are members of almost all of the big uh, software, hardware and data organizations globally. And we work with those that you can't join, like the Open Knowledge Foundation, Open Data Institute. So we're quite close to all of them. And we, we really do try to encourage that global collaboration. We're about to announce some international ambassadors joining us. We've been very UK focused to date. And we will have uh, people from all corners of the planet joining us very shortly. Um, you might be able to spot one other in the room beyond me from this. So this is my board. They've been in place now for nearly two years, about 18 months coming out for two years. A few will be stepping down towards the end of the year. We work on two year terms with um, renewals so that you can be a board member for up to four consecutive years, take a break and come back, which I think is super healthy. Um, and there will be some spaces for people to stand for election later in the year. We also have a pro bono leadership team. A couple of people are now being paid beyond myself, so we're starting to get to the stage where we're able to do that. But we mainly have people giving their personal time to make the organization run. And honestly, the commitment and the work that those people have put into it are incredible. You may spot someone from this slide in the room because we also have nearly 40 Open UK ambassadors. We're gonna cap that out at 50 and just see how it works going forwards. And the ambassadorial role isn't so much about running the organization, as getting the word out. And they support us on social media, they support us in terms of talking about Open UK when they're um, talking to the networks. You may even have heard one or two people do that today. I can tell you that they're incredible. So we did an honors last new year and we gave 100 people kind of silly little medal like the, the New Year's Honours list the Queen does. It was brilliant for me because there were people on it who were heroes of mine who I'd never engaged with, I'd never met, and we approached them like Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and they were really sweet about taking the honour from us, and Jimmy Wales. 
and they were really good about sharing the fact that they've been given this. And the single tweet that we sent out just after midnight on New Year's Day had over, no, not over, just under 300,000 impressions on Twitter. Now, I mean, we're a tiny little organisation with no money and I think about 130 of us now working to make it happen or to contribute to the, the organisation and its leadership. But that, for me, is just an incredible scale. And, you know, month and month we get between 100 and 200,000 uh, impressions across our tweets on Twitter on average. And that's the power of community. And I guess that community is the first of the three pillars that we work on. So we work on community, legal and policy and learning. The community has been tough because we've all been locked up since we, we started to try collectively to make this work. But we, we run an awards. The awards will be on the 11th of November as a face-to-face -face and hybrid event. Um, you can sign up, openuk.uk, you can sign up to our newsletter and join that event for free if you'd like to remotely. We'll be launching that next week and we'll also have a day at COP26 that you can join remotely. So they'll both be hybrid. So we have an awards, we did the New Year's honours, I think we will do another of those this year, slightly differently but because it was so successful. It really was meant to be a one-off, it was meant to cheer people up for Brexit but it did a bit more than we expected. I've mentioned the ambassadors, we've been offered a room at the National Museum of Computing and we're working with them to build an open source history room. Um, which would be really exciting if we can get that off the ground. And this is all about bringing together communities so that they can have a collective voice which can have an impact in the UK. And the impact that we, we aim for is across legal and policy. Now, a year ago, if I was to knock on DCMS or any other government department's door, they would ignore, ignore me point blank. And they did for a long time. And then at the beginning of this year, we just saw this shift and we are really now very engaged with the different departments across government in the UK and also in the devolved nations. Part of it is that we created a report, but part of it has also been our interaction here and we respond to all legislation. We've got the most amazing team of lawyers. If anybody is a lawyer or thinks somebody in their company might be interested or is interested in policy, let me know. Uh, we've got about 18 people and different people work on different things depending on their skills and their interest. Um, did I? No, I didn't put all the slides in, sorry. So normally when I'm, I'm speaking to this, I would show you, we, we actually contributed an amicus brief to the Google Oracle litigation. We were the only non-US organization to do that. Uh, we have a whole list where you can click through on the website and see what the legal group do, what they respond to, what they've been saying. We ended up being quoted twice in the national data strategy response when the government published that. Uh, you know, the group has done phenomenal, phenomenal work. And we hope to shift policy. When I'm asked, what would I like, you know, what's my goal here? I'd like every child in the UK to understand what open source is. They don't have to work in it, but I'd just like them all to know that those words have a meaning. And the way that we've gone about that was that we started a kids competition before um, lockdown. Oh, I sweated blood, I tell you, it was gonna be our pièce de résistance and we were gonna have this week of events around the competition final in London. And then of course, I was gonna send these gloves out to kids and they were gonna share them. You can imagine last year, the thought of somebody putting their hand in a glove that someone else's paw had been in before it just wasn't happening. And we were gonna bring these kids across London to the Red Hat Innovation Lab where we're gonna have this grand final. All went to pot, but we took the money that we had for the travel and we invested it in a course and people gave us a lot of their time severely discounted. And what we were able to do was to create 10 animated lessons about open source. Red Hat very generously sponsored it. We worked with the singer Imogen Heap who created this glove. Uh, you may have seen Imogen or Ariana Grande perform with their gloves. They're a bit more sophisticated than my felt glove. But they, they perform and they can catch their voice. They can make instruments using their software enabled gloves. We have this kids version, which runs on a micro bit, which has been created between ARM and the BBC in the UK. And if you haven't seen, we're giving them away. We've given away in the last week over 2,000 of them. We have another 3,000 and we've got a course which started on Monday for 2021. 10 animated lessons again. Um, the glove comes, if you have a look, I see somebody's got one, but the glove comes in a box like this and on the back it's got our little abbreviated animations of the open source definition. Now, despite having looked at this day and day, I probably still cannot remember what all 10 definitions are and I guess most people in this room couldn't recite them. 
but the goal is that kids will just grow up with them as a matter of course. So you won't just teach them to code Python, you'll teach them what it actually means, why open source is what it is and what the benefits are. And part of the reason for that is that the UK, who knew, but the UK was number one in Europe in terms of contribution to open source by number of developers and by lines of code in, as far as we can cut those stats. And this is partly why government started to engage more with us, is that we've produced this year these two phases of a report. The final phase is coming out next Wednesday or Thursday, the 13th. And uh, what we saw is that in fact, and if any of you are part of the open source community, you have been so modest and so quiet, that it's no good. We need to get out and shout about this. The UK is by far number one in Europe. We're the fifth biggest contributor in most of the open source projects we can find in the world. If you look at our Perseverance rover and the little um, Ingenuity helicopter, we were the third biggest contributor to the software that's in Ingenuity. We're the fifth biggest contributor to CNCF. Again and again, you see this positioning, but nobody really knows. And I think it's mostly because we have an engineering community that is so strong that we're so good at it, but also it doesn't really go with their nature to go out and talk about it. You need people like me, you need lawyers and policy people to go out and talk about it. And what we're hoping through the learning through the, the kids' camps and the giveaway of the gloves, and then moving from that to a school's qualification and a, an apprenticeship model next year, and then to little kids and universities to create a complete set of primary, secondary, tertiary education, not just academic, but also in the apprenticeship field that will help the UK to just develop further and further in this space, because we, we have the skills. Matt Barker is not in the room, but he's around. He's our entrepreneur in residence, and Matt's been leading a, a form of founders who from January will be doing weekly training for 10 weeks. Liz Rice uh, had to pop out, but Liz is one of the people who'll be doing that training. And we'll look at things like commercialization of open source, product development, practical stuff that you need to know if you want to found and then scale a tech business in the open source space. Uh, we'll announce it in mid-November. I'm probably stealing his thunder, but we'll announce in mid-November that there's also applications for uh, mentoring. And that group of 130 people will be drawing down the right people from it to mentor some of these UK startups. So I'm pretty much at the end of what I was going to say to you. Um, I hope you don't mind me hijacking the OIN presentation to tell you a little bit about Open UK. I just would have felt bad if I didn't get to say it too. Um, if anybody has questions about OIN, I know often people don't want to ask them in a room full of people. The very first slide and this one have my OIN email on there. I'm also amanda.brock at openuk.uk. Um, feel free to follow us on Twitter, contact us on LinkedIn. Both OIN and Open UK are on LinkedIn. Uh, OIN doesn't really do Twitter, but Open UK does. And we're quite happy to engage with anybody who wants to talk more about either organization, but particularly if you're in the financial services sector, I would say it makes perfect sense at this point in time to get your lawyers talking about open source and understanding the impact that it has on your business, how much you're using it. I remember, God, it must be 2013, sitting in one of the, the big three consultancies who'd asked me to come in and train them on open source. And you know, one side, it was a bit like being back in Canonical because the engineers would sit on one side and the sales guys on the other. In this case, it was the consultants on one side and the engineers on the other, and then the lawyers were sort of bridging the gap. And I started by saying, who uses open source? Now, if I said that today, most people would put their hand up because most people realize that it's all pervasive. It's like gravity, it's everywhere. Um, if you, when I asked that question back then, uh, the, the, the sales guys were going, no, no, we don't use it. And the lawyers were saying, no, it's against our company policy. And the engineers were just laughing. Because who wants to go and create something from scratch when they don't need to? Who wants to go and create code that might well be half-baked when you can get something you know is excellent for free and that you can reuse? And I think as we see that be understood more and more in the financial services sector, you'll have a better protection against the, the litigations and you'll be more engaged with the, the sort of governance and good practices that you see through things like joining OIN. So, I don't know how my timing's going. Sorry, there's no clock in this room and it's been a while since I've been standing up anywhere, as I've said more than once, I know. But if anybody has any questions that they want to or any discussion or points, 
don't be quiet. Come on, there's real people. I know I'm speaking to real people for a change. I actually can see you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 12, 13, 13. It's really interesting because when you go on to these um, digital presentations, sometimes it looks like you've got dozens, if not hundreds of people listening to you and nobody ever says anything then. And I've now got 13 real people and none of you want to talk to me. Go on. No questions? I'll assume that I did a great job explaining it then. Thank you very much for your patience and do, if you have a moment, stop by the Open UK booth and if you've got any questions, just let me know if you want to have a private chat. Thank you.